You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and uh, we got to do that live yesterday, Fran. That was we, interesting. We, yeah. we did get to do it. It's yeah. not too often. Yeah. it's uh, It actually freaks me out a little bit when when you kind of do that live. Yeah. Just, I don't know. Yeah, but we'll Just tell you a little bit more about that later. This is episode 188. Uh, we are getting close to 200, which is our, I guess... Some people might call it a milestone. I'm waiting for 250. Two, it, it should line up where we hit 250 right around the five year anniversary. That's the one I'm kind of looking forward to. Not to mm-hmm. not to overlook that we're coming up on four years yeah. and and 200. That's that's quite the milestone. I don't know if I ever thought we'd we yeah. still be going. And then we got to wait for 10. It's like <laughs> then we got a long gap in between celebrations, yeah. right? But, but but five years is right around the corner, so it, it feels. Like mm-hmm. in two two hundred fifty episodes, which is quite the milestone. We should probably plan something special for that one. Yeah, I don't yeah, know that, what that requires that was... foresight. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't. We're not the best. At that. <laughs> no, no, we're not. But what well, we are, uh, I don't want to say we're the best, but I think we're in the upper echelon of bringing native plant information to to the masses. I would put us up there yeah. for that. So, uh, and we have another day or episode hour change and change plan to that uh right now but yes. we have a couple of things we want to follow up on first and um friend you have in there uh tiebreaker we had put that in there like were we going to revisit the tiebreaker or are we just letting that be a tie i think we just let it be a tie i'm okay it's with a, that yeah i'm okay with that yeah we've only well, as done. long as today wasn't a tie that would be it's not yeah it's that not would be embarrassing there's, there's a definitive winner okay today. Good. Good. <laughs> so but i wanted to to bring this one up and i I know you're going to give a shout out later in listener shout outs, but this was a comment that showed up on Spotify <clears throat> to uh, that wasn't a cough. That was a throat clear um, just as a as a like a question posed to our episode on mosquito control. And it was Donna on Spotify who posed a question. This this was an excellent podcast. I have a question. If the companies that are spraying yards are saying the spray does not harm or kill other instincts, instincts, why can't they be charged with false advertising? I, that's a great question. I guess yeah. technically they could. Like I'm wondering if it could actually be a large class action suit, like if a large amount of people said more harm – because this, is, this mm-hmm. isn't just a problem today. Yeah. This has been a problem for decades. Yeah. Like I remember – and I know I've talked about it in the 90s. I had worked for True Green. And mm-hmm. customers alleged that spray had killed their pets, yeah. and I guess that's proving it. Yes, may be the hard thing, and then a lot of people being able to prove it and bringing a class action suit. I just think a lot of people don't want to go through that effort. They, yeah, they, it's just easier for them to say, "I don't want to do this anymore." I think it's a, a combination of that and. Um, it's 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 not that it's that difficult to prove it is but it is at yeah. the same time difficult to prove um you need to have enough people and uh realistically you need to have enough people affected that care a lot of the times when you have these lawsuits it's because there's a like a monstrosity moment yeah and that gets the something moving on it yeah. and um i think the people that care if there has been yeah. that I yeah. think a lot of times if there is that, people aren't seeing it yeah. or they aren't caring about it. Um, they're thinking, oh, this is a good thing. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm thinking probably the people that care aren't paying for those services. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it would be easier enough if, if you're capture, capturing or, or, or finding dead insects mm-hmm. to have them sent out for, yeah. to find out what killed yeah, them. for sure. Like I'm, I'm sure that's doable and putting a case – Mm-hmm. I guess the hard part is, did it happen on your yard? Did it happen? You know, you're dealing with something that flies. Yeah, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Did it happen somewhere else and come here? You have to be yeah. able to pinpoint. Say they died of this. This, this chemical even, was they, yeah. sprayed on my property. They died because of this on this date. Yeah, and that like 
how do you prove that? It, that's I'm sure it's provable. It's just someone the, someone the caring yeah. enough and and willing to put the money into it. And then if you can prove that, then you could probably do a class action suit for other people that have witnessed same things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's um I, I guess that would be my my reasoning why they haven't been charged with they, they may have been charged with false advertising. Listen, if this if this is that big of a business and someone brings a suit, I'm sure it was mm-hmm. handled and settled very quietly out of court. Yeah. Yep, for sure. And probably yeah. the person that, that sued can't talk about it. Yeah. And then at the end it's like again, who's the who's the payee? Because it's you're not it's not affecting you. It's, it's affecting the environment. Yeah. yeah. Very so, good question. But I – Yeah. So – and I – if and this is something that's actually – I've seen happening. I can't think of the, the instance, but it's, you have a party that um, doesn't have – literally doesn't have a voice. Like a, yeah. a B cannot go and testify <laughs> on, a, on a stand and say, hey, this happened to me and – if you do this as the like there's people saying we can sue x y or z on behalf of the environment the environment um yeah yeah no i i think it's yeah it's interesting Um, it's it it poses a great question and i don't know honestly i hadn't really thought about it um, so when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's a great question. I wonder if it has happened. Um, and if not, why hasn't it happened? Because I'm, listen, I'm, I'm telling you what, what the salesperson told me on my property was in no way, shape or form mm-hmm. accurate. Yeah. Was it somewhat truthful? Somewhat, but it wasn't accurate. It was they were dancing around the truth. Yeah, and I think that's some of it too. Is uh, does the corporation's lingo actually say yeah. say oh this doesn't harm anything else, or is it the salesman, the individual misquoting what the talking points are, which could be uh, yeah. that, so, you know could easily be like hey we fired that salesman he was giving you misinformation that doesn't represent yep. us. Yep. So, so I think that's very possible as well. There's there's so many ifs and whats. Here's the best thing. If you care and you know this is an ongoing issue, don't use the services. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's that's the best way to, to go about it. But what's great is we're having these conversations, and I love that, and it's bringing more awareness. And like I think we said before, just have those conversations. If you have neighbors that are, are using the services, just have the conversation politely. And just say, I don't know if you you're hearing all the facts. These are these are some of the things I would heard or read. Mm-hmm. Yep. But. Yep. Do you want to talk about yesterday? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we had the opportunity. Um, it was kind of on the other end. We weren't doing a presentation. We got to sit in on a presentation given by an environmental science club mm-hmm. uh, with a group of students that were AP environmental science students in scotch or what actually it was scotch plains what was the name of the school scotch plains fellowship fanwood fan scotch plains fanwood school in, kind of in the westfield yeah well where, Scott, it's in <laughs> yeah scotch right on the plains. edge of the scotch plains yeah, and fanwood yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but i know we drove through westfield yeah, like that yeah. area um so who were their teacher has called in before mm-hmm. Uh, asking advice about a courtyard for a pollinator garden, and we went up and saw the courtyard that the the students were looking at, and they gave a. I I don't know how you felt, Tom, because we didn't really talk about it that in depth afterwards. Yeah. But I thought that was an incredible presentation. Yeah. Like they kind of thought of everything. They had soil testing, mm-hmm. um, breaking it down into quadrants that can be done by. By school year yep. in different classes and what the plan was for each quadrant uh, to make sure it, it coincided with maintenance for the, mm-hmm. the maintenance. I they they did their due diligence and I was very impressed mm-hmm. and I thought it was a very good plan. Um and and it was planned out for the future as well. Like it's it, they're basically creating a living classroom in a courtyard for generations to come. And I thought it was Wonderful to see not only students thinking environmentally. I, I felt that their teacher 
was also doing a very good job shaping yeah. these young minds, getting kids to think about these things and getting them – You know, we had one student saying, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this as a career. Like as I graduate, this is what I want to go to college for. It was just really nice to see a, a very – a great group and a diverse group of, of students very passionate about this and thinking about it in a mm-hmm. way that was focused where they can get things done. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Yeah, no, it was just uh, – it was inspiring, I guess, yeah. to have people that young that were that well spoken. Um, you could tell that they were passionate about it, and then uh, and knowledgeable is, yeah. is a big thing. So, yeah, yeah, they didn't really stutter, stumble. It was, it was no, better, not at all. It was better than I expected. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> you go to that kind of stuff, and it's like I've I've judged uh, some like youth organization public speaking type things and it's like sometimes it's oh man well this is this isn't you, great but you and i have both judged ffa entries yeah. on like native plant displays and things like that and and you could tell that some some of the students didn't quite get the task at hand yeah um because they weren't using native plants in some pl- in some cases they were oh, using yeah. invasive yeah. plants um so to see there were no holes to poke at all in the presentation, only advice to help make it a little bit better. Yeah. Um, which it, I don't know. I, I was very touched. I got home. I, I talked to Agatha about it. And mm-hmm. I was like, I, it was just nice to see that. I wish environmental science had been a course that was even offered when I went to high school. Did Now, I know the high school that you went to, Tom, was a little more agriculture-based. Did they have an environmental science class? I don't think so. Yeah. But uh And there were a lot of kids. Remember. Like we got yeah. signed certificates from the kids. That was at least two oh, classes yeah. worth yeah, of definitely. kids. Definitely. So it was nice to see that as part of the curriculum as well. And plus you know, Zach had done uh a great job. Like even the classroom paintings of Yellowstone and Terrapin there were mm-hmm. there were Terrapin turtles, there and were the Rainbow Trout Rainbow Trout yeah. in the class. It was uh I don't know. It it was really cool, and I, I kind of thought, I'm like, man, I, I really wish this had been something offered when I was a kid yeah. because I, I probably would have yeah would have done it. Yeah. One uh one little critique in what you were saying there, Fran, is uh is you referred to the the parts of the courtyard as quadrants. Oh, they're not because that would be four parts. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So I don't want someone writing in no. saying, Fran, I, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's a sex tip. <laughs> so I don't really know. <laughs> one, two, three. If there's six? Four, five, I I, it was probably more than that. Yeah. If you if you factor, no, there's in. there's six. One, two, three, four, and then was it two, the, six? Well, then you have the pollinator a, gardens and yeah, stuff in the middle. Too. I was, yeah, I guess if you, and then uh, does, does they have to be equal pieces if they're um, possibly? I don't, know, I don't know. Well, it was broken We're down into sections. Deep. How's yeah. that? Sections. Yeah, um, more more correct. <laughs> but there were bird feeders. There were sitting areas. There was signage yeah. for what was there. There was a pollinator garden. There were some other things. It was. And and they had a good place to make an impact and a difference, um, mm-hmm. for sure. Which you know, and just made a make it an area that's like a little oasis in the middle of a school, which yep. I thought was yep. pretty awesome. So it was great to see. Uh, keep up the wonderful work. If any of you happen to be listening to this episode, uh, you're all doing a wonderful job, and it's great to see. And it, it does make a difference mm-hmm. so. for sure. All right, so let's uh, <clears throat> let's move along to. Uh, the plants that we're we're vibing with this week in uh, our segment called "That's Hot." That's hot. I realized right before I hit the button, I had the volume way too loud. Oh, I've done yeah, that good. way too many times, uh, so I fix it. Would you like to go first, or would you like? I mean, I'm looking at your <laughs> your. Uh, I'm yeah. trying to remember. I I don't want to spoil your. Uh, I'll well, say, I put it in there. So no, I know, but yeah. like I'll let you say. But okay. I have something that I learned from completely arbitrary. Okay. Kind of about this after you. Mm-hmm. Talk. Why don't you go first? All right. My plant this week is the saguaro cactus. Wow. I'm wondering where where are there saguaro cactuses in New Jersey? There aren't, uh, as far as I know. Maybe someone's trying to grow them someplace, but. Uh, as far as I know, they aren't. They're really only native to Arizona, and uh, they're kind of rare in Southern California, um, or Southwestern California. And 
Uh, it's Carnegie Gigantia is uh, is the botanical name, I think. Um, and it's one of the defining plants of the Sonoran Desert. These plants are large, tree-like columnar cacti that develop branches or arms as they age. Uh, although some never grow arms, these arms generally bend upward and can number over 25. Saguaros are covered with protective spines, white flowers in the late spring, and red fruit in the summer. The, uh, that information is all from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And you're probably wondering why I chose this plant. And uh, it's not because I went to Arizona. In fact, I did not go to Arizona. Uh, but a whole bunch of really important people to American grasslands did. Um, through, And I don't know how to pronounce the organization's name. The Volanau Climate Initiative oh, I, I hosted a, a roundtable type uh, deal where they had 30 uh, people from all over the country come to uh, a place in Arizona to just kind of network and talk and strategize for a few days uh, on ways that they can protect America's grasslands, um, whether it's the southeast, northeast, west coast, all the different grasslands um, come up with strategies that are unique to each area, okay. but also have like a national initiative. So um, Dwayne Estes was there. Uh, my friend John Seymour from Roundstone Seed was there. Uh, Kyle Leiberger was there from the Native Habitat Project. Uh, I saw some folks from Cornell, some folks from the Pacific Northwest. A lot of names I recognize, some yes. that I didn't. But I, from what I've heard, it was a really, really inspiring um, retreat that they had. And yeah. uh, I'm interested to see what comes out of it. The, that uh, Volanau Institute, and I'm probably saying that incorrectly, they've held some other ones in the past, too, on, like, forests and other stuff. So it uh, seems like it's, it's an organization – that's doing some really good work that maybe we should look into and, and feature at some point. I, I agree. I agree. That's that's something we should definitely talk about more. Um, so my little fact that I had when I saw that, and I didn't know this, that there's 1,480 identified living species of cacti. Mm-hmm. All but yeah. one are native to the Americas. Hmm. Yeah. Which I didn't – because you think of deserts, oh, other yeah. places. I'm like, oh, there's got to be cactus elsewhere. But the only cactus that grows outside of America is the mistletoe cactus. Okay. All yeah. other cactus originated between Canada and Mexico. Interesting. Interesting. Which, which I had no. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah, I, I, or as far north as Canada, Canada, as far south as Patagonia. Interesting. Actually. Cool. So I didn't know that. I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the saguaro cactus, you probably are. It's the one that everyone draws when they draw a cactus. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, it just uh, looked like a cool event, and that was one of the things I took away from some of their pictures as they were uh, – when I was following them on social media, is people posting the pictures of the cactuses and, or cacti. I don't want to correct you for your misproper use of – or in, I, should, I just said misproper. Improper <laughs> use of, of quadrants when I'm going to say <laughs> cactuses, cacti. All right. Fran, what's your plan? All right. So um, – you know, the plant I chose, not that we're a New Jersey podcast. We just happen to be in New Jersey. I, I chose a native plant that is not native to New Jersey as well. Uh, it's a little bit south of here. But uh, American Beautyberry, which is a plant I love personally, oh, yeah. um, which is Calicarpa Americana. This information comes from wildflower.org. It's a three to five foot native shrub that is found naturally in woods, moist thickets, wet slopes, low rich bottom lands, and coastal woodlands. Uh, small to whitish or pinkish flowers in May, anywhere between May and July. It's That's a nectar, nectar source for butterflies. The fruit are purple droops that are loved by birds and appear in late fall to early winter. It's native so, from southern Maryland to Florida, west to Texas. It enjoys part shade and moist soil conditions. So I know there's non-native uh, calicarpa out there mm-hmm. on the market too, which yep. are a smaller berry. It's a, a calicarpa dicotoma. I, I believe is the, the yeah, non-native, sure. the Asian uh, beauty berry. But uh, the Americana has much larger uh, droops. Uh, birds love them. It's it's just one of those one of those plants that right now mm-hmm. in full berry, now that the leaves are dropped, it just looks spectacular. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a fantastic plant for wildlife uh, in addition to being a beautiful plant. Um, but all kinds – it provides so much habitat because it's a shrub for like quail and, and those kind of things. And then um, it attracts insects, which then a lot of those ground nesting birds will eat. Uh, the berries are very great for birds. Uh, and then deer like to eat them as well for those of you who have deer problems or 
or looking to attract deer. So, yeah. so I see it often in, in habitat plans for like hunting ranches where they want to create more deer. I don't say ranches, but where they want to try to create more deer habitat for better hunting. That's a plant that they really target. So uh, on leavesforwildlife.com, they say that it's the larval host plant for the snowberry clear wing, the cranberry spanworm, the rustic sphinx moths. Um, the seeds and berries are important food for over 40 species of bird, uh, especially northern bobwhites, robins, mockingbirds, woodpeckers, and finches. So mm-hmm. uh, great plant. you know. And even though we gave that native range of southern Maryland to Florida, I know – I, I see it north mm-hmm. of there as well. I've seen it in Delaware, New Jersey, not naturally, obviously introduced, but it can handle those climates. Yeah. So, yeah. two great choices. Uh, if you don't know, I well, I, I guess you're not putting that cactus in your yard. If no, it, I'm not. yeah, that's that's a little bit more specific. Uh, I don't think if you're in a in in the Northeast or, or you're, you're you're putting one of those in your yard, but. Uh, it's always good, especially since most of these are native to the Americas. It's good to to learn a little bit more about the cactus. We're not in an area where they they grow naturally, so if you are, I'm sure you know it or or may have seen it. So learn a little bit more. Calicarpa, great plan if you if you have the opportunity to get your hands on one and add it to your property. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great plan to, to add. Uh, so we don't have a tiebreaker, so we can. I guess we can go into. This or that, and mm-hmm. talk about who won. You can get with this, or you can get with that. So, last episode 186, we talked about uh, my article was birds in agriculture uh, being more vulnerable to heat. Tom's article was the fastest way to kill your lawn, and I inched Tom out on that one nine votes to seven. We got a lot of votes early on, and then it yeah. just kind of died in the in the thing. We got. I have to do a better job of. Of uh, bringing it back to attention before we we um, go to air, so people have one mm-hmm. last chance to vote. So I'm going to go first if you're cool with that. Yeah, go ahead. So my article this week is um, – wow. You know, what is your article, friend? You know, I'm you just looking at it. Well, here, here's what's funny. Like I did this – I put this article in probably two weeks ago, yeah. um, and I forgot what I – I chose. I'm looking at. It, I'm like, really? That's that's my article. <laughs> like it kind of threw me off right before I said the the title. So uh, the name of my article article is called "Night Study of Native Plant Survival." This is by Flinders University, uh, and it was published November 27th, 2020, yeah. 2023, and can be found on phys.org. Yeah, and what I thought was interesting because I'm like, I've never heard of of. I would have pronounced it Flinders, but I yeah. pronounce everything wrong. I, I Flinders, Flinders University. I've never heard of that before. Is that like some Canadian school? I've never like. Is that Australian? It's I Australian. It's Australian. Yeah. So it's, and I could be saying it improperly too. It's I think you pronounce it Flinders. Flinders. Each of it. All right. And it, it's not that long of an article, so I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, with land clearance. Bushfires, weeds, and climate change, small pockets of native vegetation are important for future plant and animal conservation. But do plants in small reserves struggle with reduced habitat for both plants and their pollinators? This question has led Flinders University researchers to take a close look at whether the reproductive output of a common moth-pollinated plant is lower in small conservation reserves near Adelaide. It, one of few studies globally to focus on the possible negative impacts of small patch sizes of native vegetation focusing on native plants with nocturnal moth pollinators, the researchers compared levels of reproduction in the common flowering Australian moth pollinated plant Stachalcia aspirococca, uh, subspecies cylindrical inflorescence or species cylindrical inflorescence across conservation reserves ranging in the area from around one hectare to about – 1,000 – I guess – what's 1,000 HA? Is that hectare? I think it's still, yeah. Hector. Okay. The article impact of reserve area on reproduction of a moth-pollinated Stachalcia, uh species is in a fragmented landscape. It has been published in Austral Ecology. Our study found that a variety of night-flying moths, including species common in the Adelaide Hills, visited the flowers and carried pollen of the plant across small and large conservation areas, says Dr. Alex Blackall who recently completed a Ph.D. at the Flinders College of Science and Engineering. 
We found that reproduction of the plant in a small reserves was similar to that measured in large reserves of native, native vegetation. The research seeks to address whether plants are able to successfully reproduce and survive long-term in small patches, given small remnant vegetation patches that may be able to contribute significantly to the conservation of native plants. Previous studies in Australia have indicated that both pollination and reproduction of plant species may decline in small areas of native vegetation. Whether plants are able to successfully reproduce and survive long-term in such small patches is not always clear, and lower plant reproduction in smaller patches of vegetation would certainly be of conservation concern, says Dr. Blackall. Particularly with climate change and other pressures, field-based ecology research over multiple years examining both plant-pollinator interactions and associated plant reproduction is more important than ever. The article used data collected at several sites in the Adelaide Hills between 2017 and 2019 and included video recordings and researcher observations of flower visitation by pollinating moths. We found these inconspicuous insects remove and carry large amounts of pollen similar to the recent findings for bagong moths in the Australian Alps. Our study provides a clear example of the role of moths in pollinating Australian native plants, which is very understudied interactions, added Dr. Blackall. While the researchers were heartened to find robust levels of plant reproduction in smaller reserves in their study, they noted that the species of regions decline in moth, common butterfly, and other pollinator species in southern Australia raised concerns about future pollinator abundance and diversity in the study region and possible impacts on the pollination and reproduction of native plants in the future. So I kind of felt that was interesting because we talk about homegrown national park mm-hmm. and that if – you have a small amount of plants, but you have the connectivity to make yeah. it a larger. Does it help? And I, I was like, well, that's that's a fascinating study. Like, is a little bit enough to support? Like, I'm sure that smaller remnant pa- patches have less biodiversity mm-hmm. than a larger patch because it can't, can't support as much uh, insect biodiversity. It was just nice to know that that it wasn't impacting. The work that the moth does, yeah, they're still as fruitful in their their endeavors, whether it's small patch or large patch. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't limit that; it just limits the overall biodiversity. Yeah. So, which makes you feel if you plant one or two native plants, and we say if you plant them, they will come. It just mm-hmm. proves that that's still successful in what you're doing for the pollinators. It's just you you may not. You know, if you had more native plants, you would have more yeah. different pollinators. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's um, if you had like a, a larger patch, you're probably going to have more diverse plant yeah. palette, which is then going to. If you only have three different plants, then yeah. there's certain things that are going to like those plants, and that's what's going to you're going to well, attract. So. But they're still doing their yeah, pollinating, but it's, still, but it's still helping. Yeah, and I love that it was done with moss. We talk about mm-hmm. moss all the time, oh, yeah. the diversity, and that there's not a lot of studies doing that. So I love that we're starting to kind of like scratch the surface on on studies with moths as well. But mm-hmm. it was just kind of nice to see that. Yeah, no, they're still doing their thing. Yeah, that's not an issue. It's just you know, it's it it makes you feel if if you done small plantings in your yard that you are doing something good mm-hmm. yep yep no it's I, not discouraging had they say oh no their pollination production goes way down that yeah, would have been yeah, so yeah. discouraging but <laughs> no <laughs> but uh and i i know it's in australia but they do mention that it's one of the few studies globally mm-hmm. uh right. studying this so i i thought it was worth worthwhile yeah and i would i would assume it's probably pretty applicable uh to uh, worldwide what's Interesting too is um, is it made me think of uh, and it's not really that connected, but when we started doing the pollinator uh, seed plots yeah. and putting out actually like growing big plantings of uh, of monardas and pycnanthums and all that, just how fast things came to it, yeah. and it was kind of like one of those how did where did they come from? Were they here before? Or did they just because we have this? There's a big population boom. Like there was a few that were left, and they were foraging in the wild areas, and then they all came here. I don't know. I, but, I don't um, know either. And then, but you could really see the div- going to what we we're talking about. You could see the diversity in those fields, and that like this pycnanthum had completely different pollinators than the monarda did, and uh, than the helenium did, and and all those. But um, I, I think there's about- some crossover. But there's yeah. like they each had their unique things that would go to them. 
So I, I think about yeah. the initial trial that we did with seed plots right behind the nursery here, yeah. which no longer yeah. exist, and the Minarda punctata, and how mm-hmm. quickly, yeah, uh, the amount of pollinators on that crop, yeah, came. It was just you could hear the crop before mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to it visually, yeah. And yeah. it was astounding to me. So yeah. So um, I think this is if you. I'm assuming if you listen to this, you probably planted a small patch already. Maybe it makes you say, "Oh, I'm gonna. I feel good about it. I'm gonna bump up a little patch or help a neighbor plant a patch or uh, do their little pollinator garden because um, each little bit is helping that little bit more." Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, cool. Awesome. What do you yeah, got? Good this? article. Thank you. Uh, mine is a, a little different, and that is uh, it's titled. How Missouri is positioned to be at the forefront of the elderberry boom. I want to hear about um, this. St. Louis Magazine, and uh, which their website is stlmag.com. And, um, yeah, it's uh, – we talked a little bit about it with um, – I think uh, with, it was just briefly with mentioned with Adam, Adam for, D'Angelo from yeah. Paw Paw, or Project Papa about uh, some of the things that he was seeing and saying, oh, you have all these elderberry fields and – that are not being utilized. Oh, it wasn't. L- I think or, it was uh, Chokeberry. Aronia was it, the yeah, one was he was talking yeah. about. But, um, yeah, so I'll read it, and then I'll give some of my thoughts. So there's much left to learn about elderberry, potent- or both its potential as a major cash crop and its potential as a uh, medicinal tool. It grows wild in creeks along roadside ditches and even in the hills and glens of Forest Park. Native to Missouri, elderberry is so common and prolific that you can spot it just about anywhere in the state. It's a leafy shrub that produces cones of lacy white blossoms in the spring. As the blossoms grow into ripening berries, the stems turn rhubarb red and the green berries turn dark purple. It's not only pretty, but it's also pretty profitable. In 2020 alone, consumers in the United States spent roughly $300 million on elderberry supplements, largely due to its purported immune-bolstering effects. Between ever-increasing medical costs and the pandemic, many are turning to natural remedies to address health issues. Now, as interest surges, cold, could, or could Missouri be positioned to become the global capital for elderberry production? Just outside of Herman sits a 150-acre farm where Amelia Rizzuto and Susan Smith, of all things elderberry, planted a young grove two years ago with big ambitions. Over the years, they've each dealt with their own health issues that have turned their, towards their non-pharmaceutical therapies, such as elderberry. Smith and Rizzuto started making an elderberry elixir on the kitchen stove and eventually hit the farmer's market circuit and watched their business grow. At first, people assumed we were selling elderberry syrup for pancakes, Smith said. I told them, no, this is an elixir, a medicinal product. It's been viewed that way since 4, 000, or 400 B.C., when Hippocrates called the elder plant his, medic- or his medicine chest because of its wide variety of applications. Smith and Rizzuto advised customers to keep their elixir in their pantry. They say, for instance, if someone wakes up sick, regular one-tablespoon swigs could help ease their symptoms. They sold more than 10,000 bottles and offer gummies, jam, honey, and teas with near-unlimited culinary applications. Elderberry smoothies, elderberry martinis, elderberry everything. Recently at the University of Missouri-Columbia, Professor Andrew Thomas received a specialty crop research initiative grant, $5.3 million across four years, to study elderberries as a specialty crop for Missouri. Elderberry-based dietary supplement product sales have skyrocketed because of their well-known health benefits, Thomas says, but there's not nearly enough research. According to Thomas, who's been doing, or who's, what's been done suggests there are general benefits to brain health. There's also academic research that supports elderberry's ability to speed up stroke recovery. Some hope to use it to produce a new class of antivirals. Further human trials and brain health are underway, but a study using laboratory mice aims to measure how elderberry combined with DHA oil found in fish oil may help patients with dementia. Still, there's much left to learn about elderberry, both its potential as a major cash crop and as a a potential medicinal tool. Elderberry is not advanced at all in terms of uh, cultivar development. Thomas says, we're jumping or jump-starting the project with very basic foundational breeding program while concurrently using modern technology to set the stage for much more sophisticated gene enhancements down the line. So, yeah, it's a really cool – It's if you aren't familiar with elderberry, just a cool plant. Yeah. Um, pretty easy to grow. Uh, the flowers are beautiful. Quickly, yeah. It grows quickly. The flowers are beautiful. The berries are, are nice. Uh, you can almost just cut it down, and it'll come back yeah. and be just as big the next year. Uh, really resilient plant. And I've been hearing about these elderberry supplements for a long time. Um, my brother and my dad actually started trying to grow some so that they could maybe sell the – or they were making their own elderberry yeah. juice. Do you take some – I, I take an elderberry supplement I don't, every no. day. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is because I don't know where they come from. If I would, No, that's true. And that's – I think yeah, – elderberry is a 
there's a couple different species that are found at least all over the northern hemisphere, if not across the whole globe. Um, and my assumption, whenever I see that it's a supplement, is probably not an American-made thing. It's probably a Chinese-made supplement, and I don't know what they're actually putting I'll, in it. I'll look at the label for the one that yeah. I have. I take them, and, and my wife takes them, but we take different ones. I don't know okay. what the difference is between the two, but I'll uh, I'll look at the labels and let you know. What I find which is interesting, especially if you don't take them, the cost of elderberry supplements in the last year have mm-hmm. skyrocketed. Yeah. So I went to buy some recently. I was like, oh, that's that's a lot more than what I paid last time. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that it's a. It does surprise me that it's a three hundred million dollar supplement business. Yeah. And it doesn't at the same. At the same time, I, I wonder if some of that was skyrocketed a little bit with COVID, mm-hmm. um, which is possible. But I I love this article bringing attention to it. Anytime you can use oh, yeah. native plants as a natural supplement, um, I like that they're making their own elixir. I may actually look that up yeah. and see if I can purchase There's some a, of that a online. a friend of mine who actually makes it in – Columbus here. Actually, she oh, really? lives in Springfield now. Okay. Um, and I don't think it's that hard okay. to, to make. I think it's just elderberry juice and sugar <laughs> primarily. Okay. But, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of – why I really wanted to highlight this article is, one, it's featuring a native plant uh, that can be grown locally for uh, – I, I wouldn't even say medicinally used, just for general – Food use and culinary use. Yeah. Um, same with pawpaws. Aronia has a lot of benefits. You think about what are our, our you go to the grocery store and you look around and it's like how many of those foods or, or vegetables and, and fruits that you see you can trace back to North American roots. And there's a handful like tomatoes, peppers, yeah. corn, that kind of stuff is is North Amer- or South American roots. So it's traded. And it made its way to North America at some point in the BCs. But um, there's plenty of them that aren't. There are potatoes are another one from South America. Uh, there's p- plenty of them that aren't or were brought to Europe, modified, 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 beyond so they don't resemble what they originally looked like. Yeah. Um, and then that's part of our diets. And I think all the time... Before colonization, it, people were still eating. It wasn't yeah. like, oh, we're just going to eat. We're eating deer, buffalo, and bear. It, they were, <laughs> yeah. but that wasn't the the entirety of their diets. They were mixing in berries. They were mixing in grains that were, were native plants. Um, so just seeing a, somewhat of a return to that, you have an, an untampered with or slightly tampered with yeah. native plant. Uh, the pawpaws, same thing. Yeah. The pawpaw that you have the cultivars of and the, what Project Pawpaw is going to work on is going to look like the same pawpaw. Yeah. It's not like bananas where the banana that you see in the store looks nothing like what it originally yeah. was. Or apples even more so where you, that perfect glossy apple that you see in the store looks nothing like the original apple. Yeah. And um, so it's just I like seeing that. I think I, if I, we can have – I think the local food movement's good, especially if they're using local plants too. Yeah. I think that's a like actual native local plants. Yeah, and in and that means like in the desert southwest, you're not probably eating elderberry, but yeah. there's cactuses. That there's you other can eat. things there that so, you can eat that are native to yeah. there. Yeah, so I I just like seeing that stuff. So On, I was thought it was an interesting article, relatively short, not a whole bunch of substance in there, but it's um yeah. On a, cool. on a side note, I don't know if I ever shared this with you. So at, on our three-year anniversary, I brought in a bottle of elderflower vodka, mm-hmm. and you and I did a, a shot. And I took that bottle home, and it just kind of sat there untouched. Yeah. And then we discovered that if you put a shot of that in Agatha's homemade lemonade, rim the glass mm-hmm. with sugar. Yeah. Such a good – like once once we tried that, the bottle disappeared pretty, pretty mm-hmm. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> my my son was was making like everyone was like oh I'm gonna have a an elderflower yeah, yeah. lemonade 
So very good stuff. Mm. But two two fantastic articles. Um, either one very capable and worthy of winning. We'll post this on Monday on our Facebook uh, Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. Make sure you go and vote because. And of course, the choice is yours. All right, I'm looking up some of the elderberry supplement stuff now, and most of it is Sambucus nigra, which Sambucus candensis is the subspecies of subspecies of nigra. That is the North American one, where Sambucus nigra nigra, I believe, is the European one. So it's most most of the ones are from Sambucus nigra, and then they're grown. It's native to Europe, but it's grown throughout the world. And there's so. a red fruiting one too, right? Yeah, we there's do. the red elderberry. Yeah, and I forget what that's called. But we did that on a native plant every day. Yeah, and I think we were both stumped with that one. I'm sure we were. <laughs> Stay tuned for more of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Let's do – you have quite a few. I only have one. Let's let's do some listener shout-outs. Listener, listener, shout-out. Shout I'm going to go first since okay. I only have yeah, one. Go ahead. So I got to meet one of our listeners at a re- recent conference. It was Turning a New Leaf uh, by the Chesa- Chesapeake – I can't remember. The Chesapeake something Landscape Council. Uh, which is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and it was held in Kent Island, Maryland. A, a fantastic day, fantastic conference. Like Nancy Lawson was a speaker, Heather Holm, Albert Lee. There were so many fantastic speakers at that. But I, I got to meet Rita Tomasetti, and we met earlier in the day. And then at the end of the day, I went up. It was like right after Heather's talk, she mm-hmm. did the the end, and I went up and. As I went to say, it was a pleasure meeting you, I said it, and then I coughed at her. So (laughs) (laughs) I was so embarrassed because I really hadn't coughed all day, but I basically like violently coughed at her. So I apologized for that, and I told her she had to go home and take a drink So to to play along with the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. What, what do you have? Yeah, we had a whole bunch uh, of people wrote to us on Spotify, like uh, KG, Cindy C. Blue, uh, Brandlin Koneman. I'm guessing I said that right. Brandolin? Oh, I, I think yeah. I said Brandolin, oh, right? Yeah. Koneman, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it. That would be my um, guess. So with Brandolin, we were in her top three podcasts this year, and she's still not sick of us. Uh, Donna, <laughs> who we talked about earlier, wrote to us on Spotify. We also had one from Ruth C. on Podbean. Um, and, Fran, you – I don't know how to manage the Podbean comments. You, I can see, like, can, the first five words. You can only do it through yeah. the app. So and what that's, did Ruth, uh, Ruth say to us? I will bring that up right now. Hold on one second. It was oh, she listened to the mosquito control episode. Yes. And then she also wrote uh P S what I can see is P S maybe you aren't getting feedback. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's all I can she wrote um, I just finished the mosquito. We actually mentioned I think her comment in the last one. Okay. The uh that we 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 left out fans. Wait, okay. Was that well that was one? Susan Landau. Oh wait, about okay, never mind. All right. Too. Never mind. Hold on. So it says I just finished the mosquito control episode. Please Please make the talking point graphic that we talked about doing the for. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So which which we're trying we're just so busy at this time of the mm-hmm. year. It's 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 on our yep. list of things to do. Um, she said she also just ran across a a company called Bio Biogents that make a mosquito control that that only targets mosquitoes, uh, and thought maybe they would be a, a pretty good potential guest. Um, her P.S. was she she couldn't readily find our email address because okay. she wanted gotcha. to email us um it is on our website but you have to it's at the very bottom and you have to scroll past 20 episodes mm-hmm. to see it i started i didn't go back and put it on all the old ones but i've started adding the email address to yep. our show notes so if you have any questions on show notes uh you can go there yeah cool uh fantastic we actually believe it or not have multiple questions this week I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? So I did have them dial up, and then I went into Podbean. So let's get back. Oh, I'm sorry, friend. No, I, that's, I that's ruined right. it for you. No, not at all. All right. So the first one is from a familiar voice that hasn't called in in a while. 
So it's it's nice to hear. This is Dr. Ewell. It's been a while, but I have a question. I've heard about this phenomenon called stratification, which involves taking live things, putting them into the refrigerator, having them come out ready to grow in the spring. This is obviously something that Dr. Ewell is very interested in. That I would like to hear more about the techniques that you guys use, realizing that some of them are proprietary uh, evil lab secrets. Uh, thanks, <laughs> and I love the podcast, as you know, and I look forward to an answer. I don't know if any of our methods are evil. I don't think we, yeah, we really don't use many evil methods. If you look at some of the other, if you look at propagation rooms across the horticultural industry, you would find some pretty evil stuff, like batches, yeah. bats of acid and yeah. and all there, tweezers and there are chemical implements stratification. Yeah. There are chemical stratification yeah. means, none of which we use, yeah. um, but. I, I don't know that there's a very sexy answer for what you do because we let things kind of naturally stratify. I, get, I can think of one exception, um, but most of the plants are given the opportunity, like especially for woodies. We kind of mm-hmm. have these raised beds and we, we sow the seeds and let them stratify naturally. So yeah. stratification may mean before the plant can germinate, it has to go through cold or warm uh, – mm-hmm. cold and warm seasons like – and and every plant's a little bit different. It may be one cold, one warm, or just one cold. It could be three cold. Yeah. Um, and and that could take a little bit longer for those plants to to germinate. The one exception I can think of is our smooth cord grass, where mm-hmm. we try to mimic the seed being kept in like a in in like a brine or a brackish mm-hmm. water, yeah. how it would naturally. So yeah. Um, yeah. we, we try to mimic that for, for well, some of the wet, for, for some yeah. of the emergence. Mm-hmm. I know like yeah. Pontidaria or pickerel weed, we kind of may keep it in the aerated water. Yeah. Aerated water and also in the cold, yeah. um, not frozen, but cold. Uh, that's with a lot of native plants. This is my general trick for, for stratification. If you're having trouble, um, is how does it come up in nature? Yeah. And I didn't make up that trick. I, Someone told me that, or propagator told me that. I'm pretty sure and it was just, hey, you're struggling with this. It's so like, well, how does it happen naturally? Replicate that, and then uh, go from there. But there, there's some stuff that needs like a two year stratification. And, yeah. So it's like, okay, you put it in the the fridge for 30 days, yeah. cold moist. Pull it out, let it warm up for a month. Put it back in the fridge, yeah, and then do it again to kind of simulate that cold, double cold. But uh, but which we yeah. do for some because there's we'll some things that, that need three things. colds, yeah. and you can't wait three winters to yeah. to have a viable seed. So, um, yeah, that's the big trick is just look how it's done in nature. But yeah. we do we, there is stuff we put in the oven. Yeah, so that's that's a torturous. That's, uh, that's true. There, well, I guess that's a seed extraction that's evil, technique. But that's evil. That's uh, and that's not so much for stratification. It is like it's certain a, yeah. pines in in the pine barrens have adapt it to only release their seed with fire. Mm-hmm. So you have to heat the pine cones to get it to release the seed. So I guess I guess that is a little bit evil because yeah. you're, you're heating pine cones. I'm just thinking some seed you want to keep safe from, from wildlife. So things like acorns, they come up rel- – they just need one cold stratification and they come up. Actually, uh, is it white oak that germinate in the fall? Oaks in the white oak family, yes. as opposed to red oak, germinate less the tannins, yeah, are more readily consumed by yeah. by wildlife in the fall. So germinate in the fall, yeah. yeah. So we may put those in the cooler over the winter and then direct stick them. They don't mm-hmm. need to be germinated in a bed yeah. to transplant yeah. it. They, we can direct stick them an acorn into a, a tubling and it will germinate after that. So they're in the cooler, getting their cold cold stratification and being protected from chipmunks or, or squirrels, that type of thing. Um, I don't know that – I'm trying to think of any other – I forgot about the, the, the pines, but we, we definitely have the the uh, emergence in – not all, yeah. but some in, in – actually not even all because some yeah. are going in a muck bed and, and sown that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just really some of the brackish – some of the brackish grasses 
yeah. are being kept in in a brine so that it, it mimics how it happens naturally mm-hmm. in nature. Yep. So yep. yeah, it's in uh, that one for well, you look at some of the emergent plants are probably a, a better example. Uh, it's what happens to the seed in the fall when it releases. It's it's on the plant. It drops off. It falls in cold water. Yeah. This is how we came up with that idea. It falls in cold water. It falls in cold mud, yeah. and then it sits there until the next year, and it and yeah, it, it finds its up. little home in the soil and comes up. Yeah. So that's why we started Just, doing that. Don't know if it's necessary, yeah. but it works for us. It's, yeah. There's there's other meth- methods that you know if if you're trying to replicate mm-hmm. this at home, just remember that if you're keeping it in a brine, it will go stagnant. So yeah, it's you have to yeah. you have to periodically refresh mm-hmm. yep. the brine. Yep. So, um, and we do have a second question or a comment, I should say. It would be nice if I I turned it up. <laughs> Sleigh bells ring. Are you glistening in the lane? Snow is falling. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight. Hello, fellas. It's your old pal, Saul Rosenberg, with a felicitation for the holidays. That means a greeting, Pam. Uh, Thomas, uh, Mr. English Muffin, I trust that you're very well and and enjoying uh, good holiday cheer. And uh, Pam, I know you are as well. Perhaps having a sip of uh, the spicy wassail. Uh, Thomas, as you can imagine, that was one of Pam's nicknames uh, when he was a younger person, spicy wassail, with, you know, the apple juice and, and uh, some other ingredients. Which, being the family show, we won't really talk about it, but there was rum involved. Okay, <laughs> moving on. I hope uh, that it's not too late that some of your listeners and viewers out there on the TV show uh, would be making some bayberry candles for the holiday. Um, it takes quite a few of the berries to make a candle, but I think you'll find it well worth it. And the aroma as it fills your your home is quite delightful. So I, I do hope that you will recommend that uh, to your viewers, uh, uh, Pam. Now, on to my life. And thank you again for asking. <laughs> I want to tell you guys, Litmus was such a hit. You sent up a busload of your viewers. Uh, the Thanksgiving performance was sold out. And, of course, things got a little testy. There was a little fighting to get in at the last minute. But everything worked. And I'm just so pleased to announce my new role. It was going to be off Broadway, but you know how things go. It's going to be a hit again, and I'm very excited. We're doing a play called <clears throat> DC's Planetarum. And it's, of course, Pam, as you know, uh, about the life of Carl Linnaeus, who was famous for his uh, uh, binomial. Uh, a method of plant uh, classification, and yours truly, Saul Me, uh, has the lead song. It's going to be a hit. I know it. And it's called That's Classified. So uh, I'm very excited. I want to wish you both a very happy and a festive uh, holiday time, however you celebrate. And uh, I'll probably be giving away some tickets for uh, Species Planetarum. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned here to the broadcast with with the native men okay uh, guys your friend Saul saying uh, uh happy uh however you celebrate and uh you know keep it clean pam bye now Saul sounds maybe a little under the weather i he hope did, he's, yeah i hope he's yeah. feeling okay but some interesting uh topics to make musicals mm-hmm. but <laughs> i yeah. gotta laugh at that's classified that's yeah that's yeah <laughs> Yeah. Can't wait to hear that. I wait, so, how can you reveal your nickname for the secret? Is a uh, spicy, <laughs> spicy wasso? I, I I don't think that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I don't think that's true. But um, yeah, ba- you know, we didn't t- we we used to do it early on in the buzz, and I feel like we've kind of covered all these topics, and we've never really revisited them. But Bay- Bayberry candles would be, you know, if you're looking at a way. Mm-hmm. For Christmas holiday, that would be a wonderful uh, native yeah. scent uh, yeah. that you can do. Ob- obviously, you know greens out of 
American Holly mm-hmm. or or Magnolia, uh, Southern Magnolia would make for great decorations yeah. Yeah, as well. Sure. But we always appreciate hearing from Saul. He kind of hibernates every now and then, and we don't hear from him mm-hmm. for almost a year, and then he pops back up. Uh, so we're back on his radar. So interesting, Carl Linnaeus. I'm waiting for uh, the next one to be like Darwin related or something like that. What do yep. you think? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we. No grow read a book. I see you put a topic in. I did, yeah. Just something quick for us to at least touch on. Sure. What do you got? And that is, uh, if you look at the the uh, recommended planting zones. So, like yes. your where your New Jersey are, well, where we are in New Jersey, zone seven, right? Yes. Um, those zones have all shifted recently. Oh. Uh, oh, you hadn't seen this? No, I have oh. not. Seen oh, this, this just happened uh, within the last three weeks. I want to say, um, within the last month for sure. Uh, where all those zones have now shifted to the north slightly. So like North Jersey, where it used to be 6A, yeah. is now 6B. Very interesting. So not like a huge shift, but a shift. shift. Now you go out to the Midwest, that shift was a little bit more significant. Something we actually talked about, I don't remember if it was a, one of my articles one week. This is over a year ago. Yeah, I know we, sure. we talked at some point. But um, we were talking about how the Midwest is heating up much more rapidly than the rest of the country yeah. and how in one of the issues is it could impact uh, a lot of our crop yields because uh, like you think of wheat is a yeah. cool season grass. And if it's not cool for as long, you may have issues growing wheat. You know, but um, from what I understand that it, they're also having more severe winters and I can't remember – and I apologize. At the State Soil Conservation District meeting, we watched a video about regenerative farming. And mm-hmm. I want to say it was North Dakota, but then I'm second guessing and saying Nebraska. But I think it was North Dakota. And they were saying that the winter was so harsh last year, like after the video was mm-hmm. made, that the one farmer that they were doing who who did cattle, they experienced like two weeks straight of like – negative 20 oh, yeah. degree weather yeah. below and it killed most of his cattle like they were just mm-hmm. freeze they they couldn't keep them warm enough in that in that weather like yeah. it was more extreme cold temperatures too yeah that's a and little side fact but that's uh one of the reasons um i'm trying to remember now but that happened to teddy roosevelt really he, i didn't know i that. think it was before he was president he went out the maybe it was after Okay. I don't remember. He went out to North Dakota, I believe. I can't remember if it's north or south either. This is a great story, Tom. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, he I'm went right out to one you. of the Dakotas. He wanted to start a ranch and become a rancher, and it got so cold that all his cattle died, and he didn't have any money left, so he came back east. Um, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. A little presidential fact. You, you know, it's interesting with the planting zones. You know, having come from the ornamental side of the industry, that's what you live by. Being in the environmental side now, I I haven't looked at a planting zone in over 15 years because mm-hmm. we're looking at what's oh, yeah. native to where. It doesn't matter what the planting zone is if it's local provenance and it's native to the area. Mm-hmm. So when someone gives me a planting zone, I'm like that means nothing to me at this point. Yeah. I don't even oh, know. Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting to see that with climate change that – there's already been enough that they've changed those zones because in ornamental hort, you're living by that when yeah. you're trying to plan a job. Yeah, but yeah, so it's uh, wherever you are, um, look that up. It, it's I, like a friend was saying, it's not something for the longest time. I don't even know what zone we were in. Yeah. Um, and eventually I even, well, you heard it in my voice when I was, I'm like, we are zone seven, right? Uh, yeah, we are now firmly uh, 7B. Wow. Where, uh, where we used to be 7A. Now, now it's all eco. What I eco believe. region for yeah. us? I wonder if eco regions are changing now. We just had this conversation. Yeah. I can't remember where. If it was one of the seed meetings that you and I attended, or or if it was at this conference, but we just had this whole conversation about yeah, eco regions and climate change, and yeah. and what do you plant and where? And that's a whole nother issue. I would love to have an expert on that, mm-hmm. but there's so much unknown. I don't know that there is an expert on that. Like we've talked about certain people as guests to talk about it, but I don't know. It may be something that's further down the line. Yeah. I, I'm, I have a feeling. Yeah. You know, I did say we were firmly 7B, seven, seven but we aren't. We're actually like right on the line of 7B okay. and 7A. I was looking at the wrong place on the map. but uh, I mean we had yeah. heard, and I think we had talked about it a couple of years ago, like they're seeing like NISA um, – 
like subspecies like north and south starting to like the southern ones creeping further north further than it had ever been yeah um and we knew that with sugar maples and things like that we definitely see the shift here yeah what's interesting friend now that i'm looking at it we where we are is probably i'm gonna guess there's they don't have all the roads on the map but they have some of them we are where we're sitting is probably 7b where you live is probably 7b okay if you went north of 68 it's 7a oh so like that's how yeah. and even you follow 206 it follows 206 pretty well 7a so i don't know how they came up with that as like how they do all this but interesting nonetheless interesting, interesting and, uh, that the that they they noticed enough that it was an on taking that they had to make yeah. a change and how how a lot of those zones are is dictated off of like your your i guess your average lows and average highs okay um so i think like the or maybe it might be your max lows and max highs so for 7b your it's 5 to 10 degrees celsius for your lows your winter lows and then your uh Oh, that's yeah. I guess no, no. Excuse me. It's not. Doesn't have anything to do with highs. I don't know how this works. I'm just looking at it, and it says five ten for seven B. Okay. And then I was the other side. I thought it was going to be the highs, but it's actually Celsius. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So but sorry, sorry, Canadians, <laughs> not reading that. <laughs> um, the last thing that we have for today is a take it or leave it, and I don't think we've ever talked about this, but. I, I had seen a, a stat online. So for our listeners who maybe aren't in the industry, a B&B tree stands for bald and burlapped, which means that was a tree that was in ground and dug out, and they put burlap around the root ball. Many times wire baskets are used, and the wire baskets are supposed to break down over time, and there's enough gaps in the – the holes that the roots mm-hmm. can grow through without – supposedly without yeah. girdling it. Some people remove the wire baskets before mm-hmm. they plant. Some people don't. But I found out that – I was always told that the wire breaks down over time. But yeah. then I learned that it takes 30 years to mm-hmm. properly break down. And there are nurseries that are doing yeah, thousands and tens of thousands of trees with wire guess, baskets. Where did you find out that it takes 30 years? I didn't write down the source, okay. but it was a trade. Yeah. It was actually a trade publication, hmm. so I was. Yeah, I'm surprised by that. Just seeing, knowing the gauge of wire they use. Yeah. Seeing, like, we, we have our our sod staples that we use for holding down weed mat. And um, <clears throat> there's ones I found, and they can't be more than a couple years old, and they're already almost, like, Completely disin- or I don't want to say completely disintegrated, but there's significantly disintegrated. And maybe they're, in some cases, like two years old. There's very few I find that are like look good. Yeah. So, so And now it's a little bit thinner wire. It's not like it's that much thinner, but it is thinner. So 30 just sounds like a lot to me. So I'm just looking. So, so there's a, a report from Purdue that says nine years – it, it depends on um, – uh, this is a report, Arboriculture and Urban Forestry, that they said depending on, I guess, the thickness and the, the material that they can last up to 30 years. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. a report that was done in 2002. Um, Purdue saying on average long-term is nine years. Yeah. And then I'm looking, there's a Purdue landscape report just – quickly from 2021 that says wire baskets essential lowering the tree in the hole are no longer needed and wire strands should be cut with a bolt cutter as far down as you can reach um so i was just yeah. i was yeah. just curious you know before the wire basket wire basket made it easier for mechanized mm-hmm. tree digging because at princeton all the way back into the 90s, they were not doing any machine digging. It was all done by hand. Larger trees a lot of the times are done by hand because there's not a machine large enough to dig it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it can be hand dug. As you can imagine, it's a lot more labor. It's it's yeah. labor dependent where you can have two people on a machine digging large amounts of trees. But if you're hand digging, it takes 
obviously people get tired throughout the day. It takes a large group of people to dig more trees. But I don't know if you can machine dig without a wire basket. I don't know. Yeah. I, I've never seen it without a wire basket. I was just curious of your take on it if you felt you'd rather see a hand dug ball and burlap, which obviously that would increase the price of the tree, mm-hmm. limit the amount of trees that can be harvested in a season. Yeah. Uh, realistically, I don't know enough about it to, to have a significant opinion. And I feel like I hear some different information. When when I just looked again, yeah. I saw a bunch of places that said 30 years. I yeah. don't know where they're all get. The one was an actual arboriculture report mm-hmm. saying 30 years, but all I could do was download the PDF. Yeah. I didn't I didn't look at it. And even just scrolling through a little bit, you have like you have a Purdue saying to leave them, a Purdue saying not to leave them. And then one saying you can there's like a conundrum <laughs> if you should leave them or not. Um, but yeah, I, I think one of the things I've heard, uh, or I, I've heard one expert, someone I consider an expert say is, oh, you, when you plant the tree, you need to cut all the rope so that it doesn't girdle the base of the trunk. And then I heard another really prominent, uh, tree grower who, who grows a lot of big ball and burlap trees say, uh, yeah, you never want to do that. <laughs> you never want to cut those ropes because otherwise you, the, when the wind blows, the whole tree and root ball can shift in the ground. That's the only thing keeping it – and then break the root ball up. That's the only thing supporting it you, for a while. A lot of these trees that are harvested, ball and burlap, yeah. have – it could have a tap root and very few lateral roots. Mm-hmm. So – the the sisal twine, the biodegradable sisal yeah. twine tied to the basket is holding that tree upright. You remove yeah. a lot of that stuff, it's so loose in the root ball that you're basically bare rooting it. Yeah. Which yeah. is is causing damage. Um Yeah, this report is just saying all the findings of what people say with wire baskets. So it's mm-hmm. it's all over the place in different reports. So I don't know that there's one definitive report at all. But you know, it's it's to me it's another casualty of doing business like we're guilty of of the plastic that we use with plastic mm-hmm. pots and and uh, flats although someone just told me that there may be a new product coming out that that will be very unique as far as plastic use goes I think that yeah. was at the latest conference yeah. but you know wire baskets I think is another casualty of of that doing business being able to provide is it's it's doing more good getting more trees on the market than the damage that it does i think using it using using the wire basket yeah. you're doing more good getting the trees out there with yeah. good survivability than not using yeah it. that's what i would think at a, at a reasonable price and a lot of what what i'm just reading now is saying that the wire may take a lot longer to degrade but the welds break really easy okay so the the wire can then as the roots push against it it's not holding it in place it's actually the root is pushing it a lot of cases yeah um and making room for itself now i and which is way better i've seen this where in certain one of the one of the nurseries that i worked the office had been landscaped beautifully Mm -hmm. and it got to the point where some of the stuff was getting a little big and customers offered to buy the plants like dig them out and buy them well, it, I found out prior to me working there, the idea was to put plants in that we that were grown at the nursery mm-hmm. and change them often. Yeah. Well, they weren't changed; they were left in the pot. So, this person went to dig out a holly yeah. that was eight foot tall, and it was still in a two gallon container. So the roots grew through the pot. Yeah. But yeah. the pot yeah. essentially was still there. Yeah. Which was really, and he was like, "I don't want this," and we're, we're like. We're fine. We get it. Yeah. You know, and we realize that everything else is that way too. But yeah, yeah. where a wire basket would have broke away, maybe not disintegrated, but wouldn't have been in the same form or detrimental. Mm-hmm. This yep. was still surprisingly that the roots grew through it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the plant was there. But if you would have saw the root, I wish I would have had a picture that was mm-hmm. prior to cell phones with, yeah, with yeah. cameras. Oh, that's interesting. But um, you know, and we've seen it with Spartina in courts where the project got pushed long enough that the roots. Right through the plastic, yeah, 
Oh yeah. But the the plastic was there, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. It's um I know it's it's detrimental. I don't know that there's a better way. Yeah. You know, yeah, I that's have That's kind of how I feel. I I you know, you have to be cognizant if you're buying a bald and burlap tree. I I think the proper way to do it, which I would prefer, it's it's using biodegradable sisal twine. Mm-hmm. You have to look because sometimes they use poly twine, yeah. And you have to make sure, yeah. all right, you cut all of that away mm-hmm. uh, because that's not going to biodegrade, and you take yeah. that off before. But you put someone it in I'm there. reading is saying, like what we were talking about earlier, is you leave it and then come back and cut it a year later, later. so that which, it's which you can it has the cha- the tree has a chance to establish some roots so that it's not going to yeah twist. So yeah. as long as you do that, because if you're if they use, you know, with the sisal twine with biodegradable, you leave it on there. The, like say you leave it around the neck of the tree, mm-hmm. it may girdle it a little bit, but it's going to lose its tensile strength over yeah. time. That polypropylene, yep, yep. Uh, oh yeah, rope is doesn't. not, and and you know what kind of growth you can get in a tree in one yeah. season. Like that could be detrimental. Oh yeah. Um. So that at least be cognizant of that when you purchase a tree, mm-hmm. if it's bald and burlap, what kind of twine it's using. Yeah, for sure. But if you don't see a basket, more than likely it was hand dug. Mm-hmm. Uh. So just appreciate the craft of that. It's yep. really like a lost art. And when you see it done well, it's it's pretty fascinating cool. and amazing. I think that's all we got, Tom. Yeah. No, that's all I have. Um. So well, yeah. With that, I'm going to thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to the buzz. Thank you everyone for listening. to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pylons Nursery. As usual, thank you, R.J. Comer, for our Buzz intro theme music. Uh, I think that's here to stay. I think all of our theme music mm-hmm. pretty much is here yeah. to stay at this point. Make sure you stream or buy R.J.'s music wherever you consume your music. Check out his Americana playlist on Pandora. Uh, big thank you to Dave Bennett for our Native Plant Anthem. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Native Plants underscore Healthy Planet. And YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Don't forget about the question and comment line. It was nice to see that we had a few calls this time. You can call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that. 215-346-6189. That is also in the show notes. You can call and leave a comment or ask a question. We'll do our best to play it on a future episode of The Buzz. And a lot of great interaction on the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. Love the Mothman post. And I see people are buying yeah. our merchandise. Oh, yeah. The the Bigfoot Bigfoot Habitat Manager was a big hit. Yeah. So, uh, and you can find that merch on our website, which is www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. There's a link right at the top. Don't click the banner, the picture. You got to click the link below it. And that takes you to our Teespring store. We don't keep any of the profits from that. Uh, We give them to organizations we think are doing a really good job uh, in the native plant realm, Uh, real boots on the ground stuff. So, um, you can uh, listen to our podcast really wherever you're listening now is probably the first place to start. And if you haven't subscribed, hit subscribe. That does us a, a lot. Um, is a big favor to us. Uh, if you haven't left a review, uh, I urge you to leave a five-star review. That goes a long way um, in helping us know that we're doing a good job pushing us up in the charts so that more people will see uh, and learn about native plants. We, we did have two new five-star reviews, yeah. but no written but no comments. comments. Yeah. And that's if you leave a comment, that's when you get a shout-out on our, our Buzz episodes. Yeah. So. Um, Fran, I will, I will, if you do have a secret, I okay, don't have a secret. I'll share the yeah. secret I shared with you guys. So it's a, a slightly told secret. And, um, so I was on a zoom meeting last night and, uh, and I, <laughs> it was one of them where I was like, it's not a group where I have to say much, but I want to listen and, and be present. And, um, and there was one point where I did have to say something and, uh, I was, I've told my wife, she had some other stuff to do. I'm like, I'm fine watching Graham, uh, my son, while we're doing this because, uh, like, I don't have to say anything. If I have to say anything, I'll just step out of the room real quick, unmute myself, um, and then say it and then come back in. And uh, so that happened. I, there was one thing I had to say. I step out of the room. I hit unmute. As that's happening, my son is running up to me and then yells at me, I have to go poopy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't I don't, and it was it was almost like simultaneously as when I was hitting the button. So I don't know. I, I one of my friends was in the meeting, and I texted her and said, "Hey, did you hear my son say this?" And she's like, "No, I didn't hear it all." But when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, I I'm, I don't I'm not too embarrassed. But that is it was awesome. just like what what timing for that? Oh. I had a Zoom call one time where um where 
I what I'll do is on well, the ones where I'm listening. So this was just like more of a presentation, but they had everyone's cameras could be turned on. I had my camera turned off, um, and uh, and I was muted, and then I was uh, I had to get ready for another meet. So I'm on a Zoom call. I had to go get ready for another meeting, and so I had to like shave, take a shower, do all this stuff, and I like so I like basically put my phone on the counter, shaved. Um, that I like, I, I shave in a different bathroom, yeah. uh, then because I don't want to make a mess like no, in I gotcha. our bathroom. Yeah. I, I clean up the mess. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like I don't clean up the mess. I it's just it, a though. lot more apparent in one bathroom than another yeah. if I miss a little bit. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if that makes me sound like a good person or a bad person. No, I get it. I yeah. get it. So, um, so I did that. I walk with my phone in the other room. I set it down on the uh, the counter in my bathroom now, and then I see that my my camera was on, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I don't remember if my phone was face up or face down. I don't think I had it in a place where you could see me anyway. Yeah, but it was just like, oh my god, did people just see me? <laughs> like, and, and I was muted, so no one could hear yeah. anything. And the presentations going on. Who? How many people actually like staring at That's other true. people? Um. I do that on Zoom. In Zoom meetings, I'm, like, not looking at the presenter. I'm scrolling through the gallery and, yeah. like, looking and at everyone else who's there, if, seeing whose camera's on and if not. If your camera's like, off and then it goes on, it kind of brings you to the front. Yeah, I know. So you may have popped up for so, – I haven't had any any weird yeah. Zoom Hopefully stuff was pointed issues, the other yeah. way. And, yeah. <laughs> and I even thought about it. I'm like, if my – the one woman who presides over these meetings is really good and she saw my camera was on – she would have said something or turned it off if it yeah. was if it was something bad. Yeah. Um, and then uh, so I'm like I'm thinking I'm as I'm taking the shower and listening to this meeting still I feel the sense of relief. She would have taken care of it. And yeah. then then they're like, oh yeah, we're really sorry that Kelly couldn't make it today. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, so she wasn't even there. <laughs> like, Maybe I am screwed. No one oh. said anything to me. I don't know. Oh man. But uh, I still have embarrassment over if potentially I. Did that's, that's a great secret. Yeah. That's a great secret. Yeah. I uh, oh, you got a two for one today. Yeah, I'm I'm proud. This isn't a secret, but I'm proud that I made it through the podcast without coughing. Yeah, me there too. were a few times where I had to cough, and yeah. I just kind of like sucked it up. The other thing I wanted to mention, like, kind of as a secret, like I almost brought it up in the follow up today, but I want people to go to the Facebook group. There are some great conversations about alternative uses for live trees. Mm-hmm. Um, I posted something, and then people were posting some great uh, alternatives underneath. And actually, one resonated with my wife, where she said they they used to do that in Poland when she was a child. Mm-hmm. It was actually a fight between her and her huh. father because her mom had spent time in the states, came back, and wanted to do it the way we did it here, as opposed okay. to yeah. how it was done in Poland. So, um, if you get a chance, go to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group and check that out. I think you'll find it. Uh, very fascinating all right yeah definitely so with that thank you everyone i'm tom and i am fran thanks again everyone coming up next week for the holiday uh week we have a best of do you do you want to share who the what the best of is? yeah we we had a comment um from a couple people who well actually someone asked in our facebook group what their favorite episodes were and someone said they really liked the deer one and um as we're getting ready for Christmas, things are getting a little crazy around here. I think here. it was. I'm going to try to see if I can say this correct. I think the person was Emmanuel mm-hmm. Daniela Lickness. Okay. There you yeah. go. How's that? Yeah. See if I pronounced it correct. So, uh, yeah. So we're going to replay our deer, uh, was it deer native plants part one and part two. Yeah. So you have, um, I'm forgetting his name. It's Dr. J. Dr. Kelly. Dr. J. Kelly. And, uh, From, and then. From Raritan, from Raritan Valley Community Raritan College, Valley. who did a lot of research on deer when he was a doctoral candidate at Rutgers, and then still continues. He's like yeah. one of New Jersey's deer experts. And then you have uh, Kip Adams from uh, what then was QDMA, now is the National Deer Alliance, um, kind of talking about if you're trying to manage deer or attract deer, here's some of the things that you do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, two. Two, cool. two fantastic. The the Jay Kelly one was a real yeah. eye opener for me. Yeah. Like when we had that. Yeah, and it's something where I think we're gonna uh, get into it again at some point. Yeah, I so, think we have to. Um, yeah, there's a, a couple of my friends that I'd like to have on, and that's something they like to talk about. So awesome. Yeah, cool. awesome. So we have that coming up uh, next 
next week. So make sure you tune in for that. And until then, keep it native. In meadows, woods, wetlands, and dales grows a bounty of beauty that never fails. Our native plants, so diverse and so rare, treasures of our land beyond compare. For the friends below, soaring oaks above, these plants have the place each bit is love. Modern cattle pulls much milk, wheat so tall, these buzz about, sifting nectar to fall. Oh, native plants, how do you grace this land? In your diversity, we will take a stand. To protect and preserve our generations to come, and beauty and potency second to none. To protect and preserve our earth, to restore the native plant. Golden god asters, some flowers galore. Menard is so stunning, can't help but adore. Your colors, the fragrance, a place for the eye. Your value to wildlife, no need to disguise. Native plants, how you grace this land. In your diversity, we will take a stand. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.